Well, good morning, everyone. The title of our message today is Jesus Christ, the New Enemy of State. And the reason I did this is because we're seeing such an ever increase of persecution of the church. I know we always talk about it, but now we're really starting to see it manifest here in the West, especially in the United States of America, because in our present day, we see this campaign for ungodliness, this campaign for iniquity. It's an ever present weight on us that is increasing in its pressure. It's increasing in its tonnage. The ever growing persecution of the church, that's to be expected. The Lord told us that since the world hated him, we should not be surprised that they hate us also. But it's not just us as people they hate. They don't hate us because of we're just people and we up our personalities. They hate the spirit that testifies within us. Man is so totally disgusted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wants to be free from the God of the Bible. Now, why do I say the God of the Bible? Why not religion? Why not the idea of a God? It is because mankind is inherently religious. He is. Mankind loves religion. Mankind is inherently set on clinging on to some sort of force, whether it be naturalism or, or their own meritorious works. The world is religious. This is not us battling a bunch of atheists, although they are involved. The world is religious. They're very religious. And even the atheists are religious. They don't think they are, but they are. The Roman Empire was religious. The Sanhedrin, the very people who put him to death, that put Christ to death, they were the religious of the religious. And yet we see those Pharisees and Sadducees put our Lord to death. Why? Was it because Jesus respectfully told them that his opinion was different? Was it because Jesus arrived with a soft and subtle approach that said, well, you can have your religion and beliefs and I'll have mine? No, that was not the case. That is not the gospel. It was because Jesus discarded all their pseudo-righteousness. All this fake, faux righteousness that they thought they had and declared that there was only one way. And he told them that unless they believed and trusted in him, that they would die in their sins. They would perish. But the name Jesus is commonly received in our society as good. Across the world, it has this great warmth that comes around it when you say Jesus. It is. But you say, hey, Isaiah, I thought the world hates Jesus. You just said that. The Bible says that, my friend, they do hate Jesus. They love the fictitious idol they have imagined him to be. Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Catholics, all love that name Jesus because they have in their own vain mind created an idol of who they think Jesus is. But the moment you define who this Jesus is, you find out quickly that they all scatter and become like an aggressive wasp nest when it's disturbed. The God-man who tells them, before Abraham was, I am, is the God they abhor and hate. The God-man who says, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, is the very God they detest with so much passion and reviling anger and wrath. Understand this, brothers and sisters, many people love Jesus, quote unquote. But the moment you apply that strict biblical definition and article as to who Jesus is, suddenly there is a problem because in Christ we have a Lord who demands turning from wickedness, a Lord who calls all men to forsake their idolatrous and feeble ways of so called worship and come to the foot of the cross while discarding all forms of piety, all forms of human achievement and tradition. This Jesus, this Lord is the same one who man seeks to remove as if he's some malignant tumor on their brain, draining their depraved and darkened mind. Because with Christ, their evil deeds are exposed and they see every accomplishment they've done is utterly useless, utterly feckless. Every dark and hidden deed they've done as exposed. You know, when you back a wild animal into a corner with nowhere for it to go, it feels vulnerable. There are two things that will occur. The first is a natural reaction of that animal. And it's the same reaction that a lost man has. And that is to get aggressive, to show off the sharp fangs of wickedness and seek to strike with the iron teeth of persecution. Which is why the gospel is so universally rejected by the natural man. And that second choice is that the animal sees that it's totally vulnerable. 
and it submits and even may try to run away until the shepherd tames this animal and the animal receives the peace and the state of mind of clarity that it is now in the hands of someone who will not harm it but save it from the dangers that will inevitably end its life in the wilderness. Today we're going to speak on Jesus Christ, the new enemy of the state. As you know, Christianity is being persecuted across the world. No matter what small victories we think we have here in the United States with Roe versus Wade being overturned, and I do not mean to downplay that. I do not. That is great. Praise the Lord. But no matter how many victories we think we're seeing based on politics, we see millions are being slaughtered across the world for the name of Christ. We see that even here in America, when any form of godly civility tries to land on its feet, it is met with a total repudiation of the mouth of the wicked. And it only causes this voice of wicked repudiation to harden, to be galvanized, and to multiply. Jesus said this, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Now understand that the first word Jesus says here is not the. He says, but if. If, that is the qualifying word, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Why is that word so important? Because it's the qualifier to the second part of the sentence. Meaning, if you don't see any hatred of the world towards you, if you do not see the world resisting your testimony of Jesus Christ, if you do not see the world persecuting you, it is because you don't have Jesus Christ. That's why we have that qualifier. No man of God has ever been loved By the world, do not expect the world that crucified Christ to love you. That is foolishness. And we see that friendship with the world is to be an enemy of God. Jesus then says again, if, if you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. So if we belong to this world as an everyday person, the world would love us. Why? Because we would find commonality and unity in our own wicked desires. I had someone tell me, a friend of mine, that I've been friends with for a while. She said, what happened to you? Can't you just talk to me without mentioning the name Jesus Christ? Now, it was not because every sentence I said had the name Christ in it, although he is totally worthy of that. Instead, it was because the natural man receiveth not the things of God. Now, Christ has given the qualifiers, and now he gives a statement, a definite statement that we can rest assured of whom he is speaking about. And it is all true believers. So he says, as it is, you do not belong to the world. That is a definite statement. But I have chosen you out of the world. Another definite statement. And then therefore, that is why the world hates you. This is speaking of the same ones who persecute us. Who demand the censoring of the gospel. They're the same ones that in Isaiah 30 said this, Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Mankind in his wickedness hates God. The same ones who in Job 21.14 says, Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. They don't even want the knowledge of his ways. Understand that from the beginning to now, to the very end, We will always see God's people slaughtered for the name of Christ. God's people will always be slaughtered by the world. Cain hated Abel and he killed him. His blood cried out from the ground. Christ was nailed to the cross. The apostles were martyred. The Antichrist will seek to kill the saints and he will succeed. When the two witnesses are killed, the people will be ecstatic. Why? Because this gospel causes man to cringe and at his very core, Out of the deep inner desires of his wickedness, he seeks to slay the righteous messenger as if he is some sort of fire ant biting on his feet. A Puritan said, Man is nothing. He hath the free will to go to hell, but not to heaven. We see that is ever true with mankind, that he by his nature hates God and will seek to eliminate any message of repentance, any message of Christ, because it's like nails on a chalkboard to a man. It strikes his inner mind and causes him to lose his sanity. Don't ever let someone tell you that you are preaching hate because you are preaching the gospel. It is in fact the reverse with mankind. 
He hates the message on sin and the message on salvation. And while mankind here in America is still in a semi-civil state, here in the West, the best thing they can do is try to cancel you or to call you a hater or a bigot. Try to twist the scripture on you. Do whatever to shut you off like it's a static TV to their ears. But make no mistake, a day is coming when our blood will be shed because that will be the only way they can silence us. We in love desire so much to see them delivered from their own eternal torment. But they refuse by their own wicked nature to submit to the cross because they cannot. So yes, persecution is here and it will only get worse and worse. Men will wax worse and worse. And while there may be many forms of false Christianity, such as there are now, like we see in modern evangelicalism that claim to carry the banner of Christ and preach no repentance, no hellfire, no message on sin. These will exist as a deception for the public to say, well, we don't hate all Christians, just these judgmental ones. But no, deep down, mankind hates the gospel. And the same world that crucified the Savior, the same religious world that did this, will no doubt take pleasure in shedding the blood, the reputation, the livelihood of all those who proclaim Christ. Second Timothy says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It didn't say 99.9%. It didn't say you might. It says all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul, then Saul, was on his way to Damascus to murder Christians, to take them prisoner because he hated the gospel. He was carnal. And it wasn't until the Lord and his sovereign will revealed himself to Paul and we see a totally different man, a man who was once going to kill the Christians, later becomes a man who is suffering for Christ. The people of the world are not our enemies. And it can be hard at times when the wickedness they espouse is so overbearing. But remember that in Christ Jesus, they will have a new attitude. We all have that. We are the chief of all sinners, the least of all saints mindset now. At least we should. Apart from that regeneration of the spirit, they cannot see it. Paul said the scales fell off his eyes just as they are blinded, as scripture says, by the God of this world. Let us pray for our brothers and sisters across the world now who are dying for the name of Christ. And understand that while we have it good here for now, that when the time comes for us, we must put all of our hope in the strength of the Lord. And if it requires our life, so be it. What could be a greater cause than to die for the name of the Lord of all? This reminds me, and, and we will close, but this reminds me of great William Tyndale, blessed William Tyndale, who was burned at the stake for the crime, the crime of translating the Bible into the language of the layman. And his final words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Three years later, the king published the Bible. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for allowing us to still preach the gospel in this nation. I ask that this message touch those, Lord, of whom you will, that they may be redeemed, maybe give some encouragement to those who are suffering persecution. But we also pray for those, Lord, who across this world right now are being murdered for your name's sake, Lord. We know, Lord, that they will inherit a crown of life. We ask you to give us the strength, Lord, that when, they, when our time comes, and it inevitably will, that we have the power solely resting in you to give our life for you, Lord, to do whatever, Lord, that you have required. What will you have us do? We ask this in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen.